we were deeply sad to uh, hear of the passing of the wonderful Stan Lee, who has obviously done so much for the comics industry. Um, and whilst he and many other people within Marvel co-wrote many of the characters, his name obviously stands out as being the brand, I suppose, was a way to do it of Marvel. But he also became the brand of pop culture, the brand of comics as well, in some ways. It, his persona on the screen, whether it be through interviews um, at conventions or his cameos within all of the Marvel films, were just amazing. He had such a life about him. And I think whatever you think of his work and, and the history and the past, it doesn't really matter. What, what he gave to the industry was a character and a life, especially when the nerds out there, who, who we all love comics and, and the rest of the world didn't care, he was there with the excitement and the drive, whether it be writing letters, writing editorial bits of comics, or, as we now know him, um, jumping in as, as the, the wonderful cameos in all the Marvel films. We knew this day was going to come at some point, um, sadly sooner rather than later, but seeing him jump on Twitter and, and chat and be himself up until well, almost the end was just amazing. So I think thank you to Stan for all the work for the comics industry, all the heroes he created, whether that be his work or through other people's work who've been just pulled in by his world. Thank you, rest in peace, and sorry to all his family. Welcome to the official Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast. My name's Ian. And my name's Nikki, bringing you the best in comics and graphic novels and updates from the festival. Well, welcome to the Lakes International Comic Art Festival episode 40. My name's Ian. And I'm Nikki. And we are doing a half-baked show again. <laughs> Half baked. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure you have to tell people we're half baked. No, though. that's true. Um, we're being a bit lazy again, just because we're we're still getting back into the gear. We're ready to set off mm-hmm. as season three. We're gathering. Next we're gathering episode. things to us, but like we, a squirrel in its nuts. We do have content. We have lots. Um, no review today. We decided that we're going to again kick off with that properly next episode. Mm-hmm. Um, Apologise, she's. To Lucy, who we're going to re- review Barking. We'll be doing that yep. next episode, yep. I promise you. It will yep. be done. We have read it. <laughs> we have read it. It will be next episode. We've got loads to review. <laughs> yes. Um, so, the format of the show again, we've got to this point. This is quite a challenge when we get to this point of the year mm. where there's nothing to talk about festival related. No. Um, obviously, we, we've got creators to speak to, not a problem. Mm-hmm. We've got books to review. But I thought we would split the show. We tried it a bit last time. It didn't quite work because we sort of focused on pop culture. But I think if we stick to what the festival does, which is comics mm-hmm. and animation. Mm-hmm. And then so, so the first half of the show. will be purely to review comics. Yes. Then after the interview. We will then look at movies and animation, and we'll do it that way. Mm-hmm. Give us more opportunity to talk about anything. Yep. Such as what we just watched. What did you just watch? We watched Mary and the Witch's Flower. We'll talk about that next episode. Okay. Or listen or, to my neighbour. Or listen to my neighbour. <laughs> look at that link. I, <laughs> I think it will be on there too. <laughs> it will be my neighbour. If you've not listened, is our Ghibli podcast. Yes. She's back now. Yes. Officially, it is we said officially last episode back. we're going to bring it back. It's back. It's back. So I'll search for my neighbour. Mm-hmm. People like it. And I know weird. hundreds, hundreds I don't and know hundreds why. of people because we're we're entertaining, and we have facts. Well, we have Wikipedia. Google. <laughs> no, we <laughs> no, can't. No. no, Wikipedia doesn't work, does it? No. No. Remember Wikipedia what happened rubbish. with Wikipedia? Yeah. 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 He's on this episode. He is. I still haven't washed my hand. (laughs) So this episode, we've got interviews from John Wagner, (gasps) Una, uh, Ben Dixon, and Guy Delisle. Mm, He was so nice. Uh, We've also got 
part of a panel that was recorded at the festival, uh, which includes John Ragnar, again, mm-hmm. and Ian Rankin, mm-hmm. um, and it was uh, hosted by Alex Fitch. Yes. So, loads. Loads and loads. Loads to listen. So, it's only part of the interview. Yes. But uh, it's good. Good bit of content. Mm-hmm. So, as I said, this sort of comes into sort of seasons, and this is like, well, it's not quite a third year, it is our third season It as is such. our third season. What happens in third seasons on things on telly? Depends on the, the series. It's usually Things like Buffy and stuff are wrong. really good. <gasps> Buffy? Are Game. we going to be turning yeah. into like Buffy third season? Walking Dead, I'm trying to think. That that, that wasn't too bad third season. No, it was no. the second season that would dry We out. won't talk about Arrow and Flash and things like that then. No. Mm. No. We will so, buck the trend. <laughs> I wanted to just get a few ideas um, and some thoughts of what we're going to do for the next year. Creatively. Creatively. Well, and for the podcast. <laughs> New so, fool's teeth for Ian. <laughs> three ideas. Yeah. Three things you're going to do. So yeah, I've just thought. <laughs> play, read them out off your list that you planned for months and months. Pla- plan, plan for yes. months and months. The ones I just did as I sat Go down on. here to record this. Right. Find out about, well, find more comics. I'm okay. going to find new, obscure, kind of like, you know, creators who you don't hear about. I mean, we've got lots of that anyway, mm-hmm. but I'm going to be like a little bloodhound sniffing more things out. And other than asking Julie Tate, how are you going to do that? <laughs> I am going to do that by haunting bookshops. I think it's okay. a good way of doing this. So possibly older. Older bookshops. Yes, I want uh, older comics. So I'm going to haunt charity shops is, and things like that. I'm, I just, and I'm going to start they're all there. They're all on eBay and Amazon. Yeah. However, it's knowing what you're looking you, for. You've got to find. Yeah, yeah they're so all gonna, there. I'm going to research. Okay, and I'll let you know how that gets on. Interesting. Mm. I don't know what that noise was. Okay. Um, also, um, draw more, which I think is a nice, easy one for me to do. Well, I Just think draw more, Nikki. I agree. Yeah, you've got a comic to finish. Yes. Okay. And one to start, which yes, we'll, we'll go on to in a minute. But we'll, we'll, I've got commissions to do as well. To do. Come on, you know, <laughs> I've got to go to work and sweep life things. Life to live. <laughs> so um, in case of drawing more, though, is that purely based on working towards like a comic or yep. are you going to do something for no. yourself as well? Well, I always draw for myself. Mm-hmm. Even when I do comics, it's for me. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's how I look at it. <laughs> um, but no, I just, I need to, I was, I'd got myself into a really good place comic drawing wise and then i took more hours at work and changed jobs and now i'm not because comics don't pay (laughs) (laughs) and now i've got to refine that place Mm -hmm. and i'm i'm not as tired now i've got used to walking seven miles a day so i'm i'm less tired so i think i'm ready now in my right mindset to really start doing a lot of are you right there uh doing a lot more so that's what i'm going to do Okay, mm-hmm. and your third and final one. I think I should attend more conventions. Okay, with my stuff and sell. Well, we've got one planned. Oldham. Oldham. That's I'll paid be at for, Oldham. Booked. I am there at Oldham. Please come and say hello by my comic. I should have the next. I will have. I'm not sure. Yes, you know you will. I will have, have my got new comic like out for them. Three or four months. So you got. Plenty yeah, I've of time. only got. I've only got three <laughs> pages left, <laughs> but they're the hardest pages. Okay. So, yes, I've just got to do that. I've just got to steal myself to not cry over my work. I want to do mm-hmm. Nottingham, but it depends on how it Dressed falls. Dressed as Robin Hood. <laughs> it depends on the dates mm-hmm. that it falls with in relation to the lakes, because it's often the weekend after, which is no good. No. Um, if it's a couple of weekends after, fine, we can look at that. But mm-hmm. it's a one day and yeah. a lot of, you know. That's a long way for us to go. Stay over. It's fine. Go to Gay's Workshop on a Sunday. It's great. Do you know, I, I was waiting for that little <laughs> little bombshell to come down. Oh, and, and it just happens to be where Gay's Workshop world is. Mm. No, it's, it, it it's is what? a it's good what, convention. What, what? Oh, yes. Um, so I'm in there too. We don't we don't fancy full weekend ones just because of kids and stuff. Oh, yeah. So we want one day they're ones. they're tiring. Really. They're very tiring. Well, yeah, it's called work. <laughs> I like to swan round conventions, not uh, sell stuff. <laughs> so I've got to do that. Okay. So mine? Yes. Mine's quite simple straight away. Read more comics. I need to read more. You do, because um, I read more than you. Well, all, all the print stuff we get are fine, but it's because we haven't got a decent digital reader. I keep saying this. We're going to treat ourselves. 
after Christmas, unless Santa well, brings one. Santa's um, not bringing one. <laughs> we're going to treat ourselves to an iPad after Christmas because the one we had is uh, broken. It's died. Which will allow open up straight away Comic House. It'll open up a lot of stuff that gets sent to us mm-hmm. that I struggle to read because it's digital. Yeah, um, and sometimes you read it and I don't because I haven't got anything. Because again, really. it's not yeah. ideal. Yeah, the, the tablets we've got are rubbish. So that's a priority. Mm-hmm. I mean, anything that gets sent through print rise is read. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's not a problem. It's it's the digital stuff that we just need to have mm. access to so that they might sign up to DC and stuff. And stuff. Um, oh, what was... Sorry, what was that? They got that with DC and Marvel subscription services. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. And do you think you're doing that? Yes. Uh, okay. Next thing... Is write more. Yes. Now, this has already started. Well, yes. What do you mean by, well, you know? Well, you did throw pieces of paper at me with, like, words, odd words, stick men, and then blank boxes. And this was supposedly your writing. And what has what has become of that? Well, it's slightly better now. There's, like, actual sentences. I've written a comic script. Okay. Right, go on. What's the issue? Please tell <laughs> There's me. There's nothing. Nothing until I sit down and try and draw your ramblings. Why is it rambling? <laughs> Just being mean. <laughs> so we've been talking about this a while, me mm. and Mickey doing a comic. Mm-hmm. And we've written, well, it's going to be originally a big, which it will be, is the idea down the line, a big yeah. um, collective edition. But it's going to be set into four smaller comics. Four? A four. Yeah, not four. Is it four? It's four. Okay, it's four. four. I know, I've written it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you've written the first how many pages? I've written a full comic. All right, you've, ri- you've, ri- you've written the first I've one. I've written the first full comic 20 okay. page comic 20 page comic thank you all right so there all right i've just got to draw it i know uh yeah you i do the hard bit you do the easy bit what <laughs> <laughs> thing is i've started drawing this comic so many times now That's what and then you change it's right like, but oh. now we've got it set okay it's done Oh, I feel the plight and the frustration of all artists out there. (laughs) Well, no, because normally a writer would do this and then send it to the artist. It's because you're sat in the same. Sat here and you go, oh, draw this bit out. And I've drawn. Actually, there's pages I've drawn already. Okay, well, now you've got to practice. You've got to get your hand into gear, get yourself ready to go. What do you mean by hand into gear? (laughs) Uh, And my final one is is for the podcast. (laughs) Do more with video. I've got a video code there. I want to do stuff for YouTube. I don't mm-hmm. know what properly, but I do want to do stuff. It's just a time to edit the issue, but mm. I just want to do bits. So that's that. You see that five minute segments? Yeah, I don't know. I've got to work out. I did the v- reviews on it. That's what we were mm. going to do, that's wasn't it? We so we could do. show some of the artwork. Yeah. Anyway, mm. we'll see. Um, Pete's got a few ideas as well, which mm-hmm. we are going to play now. I've been given a little bit of homework from the pod bosses. I've been asked to come up with three things that I want to do in what uh, Ian is calling phase three of our podcast. The three things I've come up with are I want to meet more comics creators, interview them on the podcast. Through that, hopefully learn more about their processes and other comic artists that inspire them and then to promote the work of those artists and other great, favourite, best comics that are out there. Which handily sums up as 1. Meet, 2. Learn, and 3. Promote. So that's what I hope to do in the future. There we go, you see. Mm -hmm. Mac didn't bother. (gasps) Couldn't be bothered. Did he not? (laughs) He gets a D for effort. (laughs) Um... But Mike's, I'm, I'm going to make Mike's up for him. <gasps> Go on then. What's read Mike even do? more comics. Mm-hmm. Read start, more start and more comics. <laughs> <laughs> and even more comics. <laughs> Put the dice down, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, hope you enjoy the interviews that are coming up. As I say, mm-hmm. next next episode we will back to our usual. Usual. Um. We want to talk about She-Ra next episode, just because it's animation. Oh, yeah. We'll do that next episode. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure how I feel about that at the minute. Well, you need to watch more. I do, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So, check out My Neighbour. Mm. Have a listen to us there if you like Ghibli. Yes. Um, we, we will probably be looking for guests at some point. We've got a couple lined well, up. Well, we do want guests on it. Yeah, we've got a couple lined up. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Lyndon White. I was going to say, Lyndon's going on it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're interested in, in coming having a chat on there with us about a particular Ghibli film mm. or Ghibli related film, yep. then let us know. If you've got reviews, as I say, uh, uh, sorry, comics you want reviewing, we, we will have more access to digital stuff coming up yep. soon after Christmas. So send us stuff. <laughs> we'll get to it. Why are you looking at that? Are you just going bank balance? Yeah, I was just thinking, hang on, we've got to pay the telly off. <laughs> <laughs> how, how soon after Christmas? Yeah, as soon as it's paid off. Oh, God. <laughs> Until then, thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you on the 1st of December. <gasps> Almost Christmas. Do I get to wear no. jingle bells? Oh, oh, God. Bye. Need a podcast all about comics topics, reviews, and just general chit chat? Then join David Robertson, Fernando Pons, Mike Sadaka, Giuseppe Lambertino, and me, Tom Stewart, at That Comic Smell. You can find us on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes, and on Twitter and Instagram at That Comic Smell. Pull up a chair and join us. It'd be great just to hear a bit about your work. Yeah, well, I don't have much today, so it's cool. That's yeah. brilliant. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, I enjoy it. So I'm going to go see the exhibitions. Of the yeah. Yes. So how are you enjoying uh, Kendall? It's your first time in Kendall, is it? It's my first time, yeah. I'm having a good time, really. Yeah? Yeah, yeah because uh, I've been to some crappy festivals. Uh, <laughs> oh, right, okay. The two last Let's one. Let's not name any. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was terrible. And uh, this is just like, uh, you know, very, very nice. Yeah, the, the hotel, the village, and... Uh, mm-hmm. In the exhibition, I've I've been listening to some talks which I never do usually. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Well, they have so, such a range, don't they? I think such a, a, a different range to what a lot mm-hmm. of the, the festivals. That's right, and they, um, I like the the angle they take on comics, which is more uh, the cultural aspect of yeah. the, this yeah. artistic. But uh, yeah, so it's not uh, mass media, and uh, no, there's not there's hardly any Batman around at all. No. <laughs> that's right. I'm not too much in comics, and uh, but sometimes you have both, which is mm-hmm. you have your side and you have yeah. their side. So. But this is, yeah, it's very relaxing. It's, it's, it's very good for me. <laughs> so, as a child, were you into comics at all as a child? Or, or what was it, What was your yeah. start in life? In yeah, yeah. Time? So I'm from Canada, yeah. the French part, from Quebec. And uh, we were having everything from uh, Franco-Belgium style stuff. So I was reading uh, Asterix, Tintin, mm-hmm. and, and, and even the small one that they, they were doing, Philemon and... Uh, uh, yeah, so I was, I was like, we were able to follow actually quite closely what was going on uh, in Europe, in the French, uh, since they've been like the Belgium first mm-hmm. and then the French, they've been uh, so much uh, producing comics. And uh, they evolved. As a teenager, I was reading stuff that, uh, that was meant for teenager and um, I think today they would get in trouble if they would publish that because it was like very rough stuff. And uh, everybody was reading that. Well, people, I was, uh, I was reading that. And so there was a, like a constant evolution. Okay. Not so much in the English side, because uh, with the censorship or something, it just stuck to uh, what, what happened with uh, Mad Magazine and all that. It mm-hmm. stuck to one very, very um, uh, style. I mean, uh, of course, the superhero. And, and uh, So, yeah, and meanwhile, the French were, were just moving on and, and doing all these very different kind of... Uh, Teenager and then more adult comics, but not uh, adults in the sense that it was it was made independently more for adults. Um, mm-hmm. Talking about I don't know all sorts of uh, of subjects for adults. Why do you think France as a whole has sort of got this comic culture which America and the UK doesn't have? What is it you think that? Yeah, well, you would need to ask to a historian, uh, <clears throat> and that's a good question. I think uh, well, censorship in the states has mm-hmm. slowed down stuff. And they've jumped to a uh, superhero to years after, boom, graphic novel. Yeah. And now we can do that. And then they, between, it's like a big gap. And then you have uh, Arch Spiegelman, you have a few guys like that, uh, Crumb. But other than that, it's like <laughs> not much. Uh, and well, yeah, in France, we didn't have that censorship. So it was, uh, mm-hmm. oh, these books were. I, I know when I go in the. Um, in the um, uh, Mediatek in France, where you have CDs and you can borrow, uh, you have the the boot for children, 
And then uh, you have the one for, you have the comic book for adults, mm -hmm. and they are as big. I mean, you have like children, you know, and you see all the difference. I mean, the size, the adults, you, you, you go like that, and yeah. for the children, it's down there. <laughs> and uh, so you see the different, it's, uh, and you have so much for adults as much as for children. So Which it's really seen in France that uh, comic books is just. Um, not, not just for children, where, where you have that. Mm -hmm. When I go to Italy, um, even Germany, the, the one around, and even here, you go in the library and you look at the graphic novel area. Well, it's, I mean, it's all mixed together and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you have to know so. that, okay, this has been published like 20 years ago <laughs> in France, and then this is now, and it's all very different. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's quite depressing at times. Yes, <laughs> it can be. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, where did your career start in writing and, and, and drawing? I've, I've, I've worked as an animator for uh, more than 10 years, mm -hmm. then, then travel in Europe and, and f finally stay there. And I'm based in France, uh, where it's a good place to do comics. And then I discovered that there was an independent scene that I was not aware of, uh, because this was a crossing the Atlantic. I mean, we didn't see that in, in Canada. Yeah. And then I thought, oh, wow, there's actually people of my age. So it was the... Same time as John and Quarterly was publishing in Canada, we had L'Association in France and they were just doing stuff in parallel basically because uh, I remember reading the Seth's novel uh, It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken, one of the first uh, John and Quarterly uh, in Paris, I found it and I thought, wow, this is very interesting stuff. And uh, I realized that L'Association is doing that here in France and I started to, sh to send them short stories, so I worked like five years doing short stories with them, doing animation as a living, and slowly producing more and more um, comics, and then one book and two books, and I thought, oh, I'm just going to try to focus on that, stop doing animation, and I, I did Pyongyang, worked quite well, and then I thought, well, this, this is actually... Actually, well, I was doing... I was with Dargo, it's a big publishing house, I thought, well, now that I'm in Dargo, I'm good to go for... A long time, but I did three uh, color book, 46 page, and they stopped because it didn't work at all. And the book I was doing uh, really for myself and for fun was the Shenzhen and Pyongyang, and these were like, wow, this is working actually quite good. <laughs> Maybe I should just focus on these books because yeah. the classic stuff was didn't work for me. So with Pyongyang, which we absolutely oh, love, amazing. Um, <laughs> so, oh, it really is. Did you did you have a plan then to, to create that book when you were over there, or what did it just think? Right, well, I've had this experience. Let's create the book yeah. based on that. So I did Shenzhen first, the mm -hmm. one on China, because okay. I was taking notes while I was in China because okay. I have a very bad memory, and I was reading back these notes, and the only stuff I've done was short stories, like little four, five, six page, and I thought, oh, there's a there's a few funny things in China that happened to me, so I'll turn that into short stories, mm -hmm. like just one. There was 16 pages in a magazine. Mm -hmm. It was not planned to be a book. Then I thought, oh, that's actually fun to put yourself in there because that was the first time I was doing that. And I said, I'm I'm, I'm going to continue and do another 16 page. And then uh, a lot of people think, wow, well, it's a lot of fun. And we we decide, okay, we're going to stop pre-publishing it and make a book. So it was not planned to be a book. It was mm -hmm. just a, a bunch of short stories that we. I thought, okay, that's going to be. Well, that's why it's separated in 16 page with one one big image every 16 page. Uh, and then I was sent uh, to Vietnam after that. And I spent two months in Vietnam with my little motorcycle working on animation. <laughs> it's not fun, taking notes. And I was thinking, I said, I'll go back home and work and, and talk about Vietnam, Saigon. It was a lot of fun. And that was it. It was just a lot of fun. I was reading back my notes and the studio worked perfectly. The, no co problem with the communication. The, it was just uh, like... A, a very nice time mm -hmm. and um, that was not enough for me to make a book with that mm -hmm. I mean just I'm having fun I'm having fun <laughs> and this is great oh. Oh. so that didn't work for me so that teach me that it's not because I go somewhere that I can come back with a story I need more than that maybe if I would have stayed a year in Saigon then I would go yeah. deep with the people so I go in Pyongyang and I thought well you know let's play, wait and see so I was mm -hmm. taking notes but <laughs> half an half an hour uh, 
the, I arrive at the airport, they give me flower, and I have to put these flowers on the statue of yes, Kim Jong Il yeah. and pay my respect to the dear cabaret. I thought, well, I think there's going to be enough material. <laughs> As I was bowing down and saying, you know, the stuff you have to do to make a living, uh, I said, well, you know, that's... And that, that proved to be right, because every day was um, <laughs> kind of surreal. There were some boring days where it was just the same, so I would just take normal notes and read back. So when I came back, I was a bit afraid, because I had to do some ju journalistic research, because I had to put some information, because they were telling me so much propaganda shit yeah. that... They were saying, oh, now that North Korea is doing so fine in Asia, I thought, what? I mean, and then you have to read the numbers and then say, this is the only Asian country that is going down every year for like the last 20 years, so you're not guys doing so fine. Uh, so I had to do some research, and I really enjoyed that because I realized that comic books can explain very quickly stuff, mm -hmm. and it's very efficient for uh, learning. and. Uh, and I'm not surprised today that uh, a lot of comics that are very successful, they, they talk about uh, the science history. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I mean, there's one very successful in France who talks about uh, uh, Pasquet, the French astronaut, and he explains uh, with someone who's very clever, who draws the whole, the whole uh, way to become an astronaut, all they had to go through. That's very interesting. And uh, there's lots of stuff about, uh, and comic books is very good at doing that. So I really enjoyed doing that little uh, information journalistic part in mm. the Pyongyang. That was the first time I was doing that. Mm. I think one of the big things after reading Pyongyang mm. and being drawn into North Korea, we recently watched a documentary, didn't we? Yes. Um, I can't think who it was that who was at Michael Payne yeah. that went over, and just seeing him doing everything you'd. Yes. Well, written about and drawn yeah. and having those images and come to life because obviously he was dragged around the same yeah. tourist or, yeah. or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. 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 It's so interesting to see that come to life. It was brilliant. Yeah. It's, they, have, they don't have much to show around. So it, no. they always, I was reading because uh, uh, Gérard Depardieu went to North Korea and he was at the Yangakto Hotel, it's the same as hotel <laughs> that I was. And they, they showed a little clip of him going around and uh, it was where the the turtle was, like that 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 aquarium, and uh, I was trying to see if is the turtle still there, I and mean, I can't believe it. I think it's gone. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so you've recently released Hostage, is that right? Yes, yeah, right. What, what's that one about? What oh, Hostage is a, uh, it's a book that I've I've I wanted to do for the for the last fifteen years because I've met. After Shenzhen, I've met uh, Christophe André, that I read the story on the newspaper of a guy working in an NGO being kidnapped for three months, and then he escaped. And uh, when he escaped, he talked about his story, and he said, well, you know, I feel very good about the whole thing, because I, I went, uh, you know, I escaped. And I thought, well, this is so fantastic that actually someone managed to escape and come back. And... Uh, then I got to meet him because he works at the same NGO that my wife and we had a dinner once and he was there and uh, I asked him one question and he was very open, like no traumatic experience for him. He said the best, uh, the best therapy is to escape or uh, something like that and uh, so he gave us all the details and uh, he was in a room like that basically attached to a radiator and people were just you know cooking and praying and doing their own life and boom they would come and bring him food. And, and he would die, it was all shot, and then he spent, he spent more than 100 days like that. Yeah. And um, so I, I thought it was fascinating, right from reading it on the newspaper, and when I saw him, I thought, oh, this is the best story I've ever heard. Mm. I said, you know, you should do a comic book like that. He said, yeah, sure. He never told a story to a book or anything. He didn't, f he just went back to work six months after. Wow. Yeah, they sent him to Lao. They said, well, this is a very quiet place. <laughs> there is no security problem there. And, uh, and then he worked his, his own life for the same NGO, basically. Yeah. How do you find sort of writing somebody else's story as opposed to what you've Yeah, it, it, it was very complicated. I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've, I started to just talk to him and take notes, but that was not enough. Because you need a lot of info, especially yeah. when you have to redraw them. I was, I was uh, asking Joe Sacco about that, and, and the number of questions you have to ask someone, like, okay, if he's trapped in a room like that, you have to say, okay, why was in the room? And 
what was the window look like and the, yeah. the basket? What does it? And then he says, I don't remember really because I, <laughs> I asked him like the bowl of soup every day. They were giving some soup. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what does it look like? He mm -hmm. says, I don't really remember because uh, now. Uh, so I record him just like that for mm -hmm. one day, and then um, I had that material that I worked with, and I had uh, one document that the NGO has printed after to keep trace of all that. And I was going from one to the other, and once in a while I would phone Christophe because we became friends mm -hmm. and says uh, about this, and then I've put everything in order. That was a long process because when you talk, and he was telling the whole story, he said, yeah, and then, oh yeah, I remember that. And then he goes from this period of time to another one. Yeah. So after that, you have to kind of go like, okay, this happened here. So I've put all that into into chronological order mm -hmm. and you know just like when I read my notes except I was reading Christophe's note and did the book mm -hmm. and I wanted to put all the details he told me because mm -hmm. I thought they were all very interesting that's why it's a big book you know? yeah yeah but uh, that's what I wanted I wanted to have as close as you can to an experience like that because it's quite unique usually you know they, they don't escape <laughs> and uh, they don't talk about their experience because it's just so traumatic they don't want to turn the page which I can understand but him it's like yeah okay let's talk about that and then okay and then you know the door I know that door wasn't locked and, and he kind of he, they forgot to attach him and he was sleeping at that point, he was very tired. He, he could just go to sleep like that. So he finished his food and he just fell asleep like that. And he was cold. So. And they just took, and they forgot to reattach him because he was attached and uh, to lock him. And then he realized that, uh, oh, he forgot. And then he knew that they wouldn't come back before the morning and then the door wasn't locked. He said, well, that's my only chance. That's it. That's now. If I don't take it, you know, I'm never going to escape. And then he has two hours before the sun's go down. He says, if I go now, I'm, uh, people are going to see me on the street, that's mm -hmm. not possible. So he said, I have to wait, but then, okay, and then, yes, I should go, and then, no, it's too dangerous. And then, I mean, how, I mean, this is, are you, I mean, freedom is there. It's, are you going to open that door or not? And for me, it was just like, wow, this, I was just listening to him shaking, like, what did you do? And, he, and then he opens the door, because he says, if I don't do it, I'm never going to be able to, to look at myself in mm -hmm. the mirror, mm -hmm. and uh, which is crazy because it's too dangerous. I mean, yeah, these guys have yeah. Kalashnikov, and when uh, he opens the door and it goes, yeah. oh, <laughs> it's like, shit. <laughs> and he escapes. It's yeah. crazy, and he's just a normal, quiet guy, very slow paced. Uh, he was an administrator, it's just like numbers. Yeah, <laughs> not, not important really to no, no, for, for any valid reason to you know. Because you have uh, kind of adventurous guys in the NGOs. They do. Uh, all the work stuff, and uh, they've been around the world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but him, it was his first mission. <laughs> three months, get kidnapped, and three months uh, working, three months kidnapped. <laughs> That's so awful. But then he went back, and he went back because he thought, um, well, they, 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 they did so much to, to take him, to get him out of there, mm -hmm. that um, he, he, he just trusted them. Uh, you know, he said, well, they've, they've done so much, to, even though he escaped by himself, but uh, he has seen afterwards everything that they've done to, to take him out of there. He says, well, you know, I put my trust with them, and uh, they, he, he still works with uh, Doctors Without Border. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, scary. it's an incredible story. I said, I have to put that in the too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what's your, your next plans then? Are you, are you yeah. working on projects? No, nothing like that, because I think that's that's a one in life yeah. mm. kind of story. I've heard, you know, and so one, now people write to me their life on, on email and says I've been, I've, I've been in a sect for 15 years, which mm. is, it's not so much my cup of tea, yeah. escape of a place, yes, but uh, yeah. the, the, uh, kind of torture into a... Yeah, sexually abused into you don't want to draw yeah. sex yeah. images either, do you? I it's don't really want to try no. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, any countries you think you want to travel to? Or? Uh, well, we don't do that since uh, the kids are, are older. Oh, well, that's Because it was too, yeah. too complicated. I mean, they, they have their friends and all that. So, that's why I did the hostage book because that's something I wanted mm -hmm. to do. Keep postponing it because of the traveling stuff. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and yeah, no, I'm glad I've, 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 I, I wouldn't mind doing other, other trip like that, but it's a long process. It's, you go for a year, take notes, come back, and if nothing really happens, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't see why I would make a book about uh, So, 
Yeah, it's, it's kind of a... I don't see... Uh, maybe later. I know my wife wants to go back, but uh, when the kids are mm -hmm. get much older. Yeah. yeah, right now it's going to be a different type of books for me. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. From what we've read so far, we actually love, yeah. love your work. Thanks for that. Um, we've not managed to pick hot up yet. I think that's going to have to be this I'll weekend. You. <laughs> You've just <laughs> sold it to us on your YouTube. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, thank you, and I recommend anybody who's not looked at any of your work, go and have a look, because it's, <laughs> it's so individual and refreshing, mm. some of the tale, absolutely amazing, so thank you very much. Oh, thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> Might never get up again. <laughs> never, never moving I again. I like a soft looking. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're here with uh, John Wagner. This is, again, just a bust we sat next to you, sir. Um, you, you will obviously not remember, but the first year of the festival, you were, came to see me, I was working in game at the time, and I think Chris and the Nazis come and say hello to me. Oh, I, yeah. And it was just, that moment was just yeah. amazing. <laughs> you, you signed all my comics on year one, I've got my nice... Well, you, you were that stuttering guy who <laughs> couldn't speak. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, obviously, we all know about your, your, your career with 2000 AD and Dread and everything, but you brought out a, a new comic, Rock and Red. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that? Yeah, it's... Um, it's, a, it's like a homage to the comics of my youth, the comics that I read in the, the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. It, it's quite simply, but may I say beautifully, told. <laughs> uh, it all started out 25 years ago when Alan Grant and I, uh, my writing partner, were working on a new anthology comic. And we obviously one element of a typical British anthology is football, a football yeah. story. And we were thinking, well, what can we do that's different? And one of us, I can't remember who, what about an alien footballer? And we thought about it. And we'd done a similar story in the Eagle called Dunya, from which we took a lot of ideas and we, we learned a lot about that kind of story from it. And we began to work on it and realized how good it was, how funny it was. And we wrote up the first episode, and then we stuck it in the drawer for 25 years. Because we realized if we went ahead with the anthology comic, it would bankrupt the both of us. <laughs> so we, we put it away, and a lot of the ideas that we'd done for it, we used, but we never used, as it was called then, it was called Rom of the Rovers, as a sort of little twist on Roy. Uh, so... Three, three years ago, I was looking for something new to do, and I went to my ideas file, and I pulled out the Realm of the Rovers and uh, read it. It was just too good to be sitting in the door. Uh, so I wrote it up, wrote the first episode, stretched it out, and I designed it as a six-issue miniseries. The first thing that changed was Rovers. I had to be quick, uh, Just a bit sick, yeah. yeah. It was a fun <laughs> title, but it was never going to last. And then, uh, I think Mattel were bringing out Rom Space Knight. Okay. And I thought, well, they are very litigious. And so I don't want Again, any Again, just not worth the hassle, is it? <laughs> In any case, Rock's a hard and strong one, mm -hmm. and I like it better, so we changed it to Rock. Okay. And uh, I had then to find an artist and a colourist. I found my artist in a fanzine. He was driving a bus in Brighton. Oh, really? Really? I emailed him and said, have you ever drawn football and would you like to? He thought it was a hoax. I mean, John Wagner. Yeah, you would expect yeah. when you've got so many names from, from yeah. the industry around you. But yeah. eventually he realised you know, I was serious and he said, oh, too right. <laughs> so, and his, art, his artwork is really beautiful. It's so right for the story, clever. His characterization is really great. And his, because he, he didn't have to earn a living for it, from it, the detail that he put into every picture was quite amazing. And so he was great, and then, but he didn't have time to color it as well. So we found our colorist, Abby Bulma, uh, working in a traveling man shop in Manchester. Uh, she also did some colouring for 2000 yeah. AD. They sent me three or four colourists to look at and 
Abby was the one that Dan and I both picked up. So, and now here it is, a sixth issue mini series and a, and a lovely trade. It's amazing just giving those breaks to those people. You just, yeah, yeah. Be um, My personal favourite comic that you, you were part of was uh, Dread vs. Batman. It's always been yeah. one of my favourites. The, 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 the story, the characters, obviously. Yeah. Is there any character that's not linked with Dread so far you'd like to see? Come on, come would like, I, I would love to see Dread Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to be a one-sided battle. Last Get up, <laughs> Donald! <laughs> right, well that needs to happen. I'm sure, to be fair, I'm surprised it hasn't already in 2018. That would be amazing. Yeah. It may be the, the subject or something like that of third series of Rock of the Reds. The second series, which we're working on now, is called Rock of the Gods. Okay, so it's good. And the third series, I was thinking, well, maybe you should get into politics. <laughs> so we'll see. That, that sounds really cool. But Dread Donald Trump, yes. That's, that's yeah. going to happen. It's going to happen. Brilliant. Thank you very much, oh, John. Well. I won't take much of your time. Brilliant. Yeah. Is yeah. this for the radio or um, podcast? We do. <laughs> we've not actually yet, no. So, we, 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 we do, huh? yeah, we'll, we'll have a look while we're talking. Um, so, first of all, obviously, Becoming and Becoming was one of our books of the year last year, you know, it was up there. Um, and it was, how, how do you talk about this book? <laughs> so, it, it taught me such a lot, you know, as a, as a male, you know, growing up literally through, through the years, so which you don't know. You don't see what people have been through and the, the, mm. the, type, the things people have to deal with. How did you find creating it? Was it? You mean becoming and becoming yeah. now? Yeah. Um, so, well, it took a long time mm -hmm. to gestate. Uh, yeah. Several years, really, before it sort of started to turn into a book. Um, I mean, I was talking to someone about this last night, actually, about uh, kind of writing very personal stories that are difficult yeah. stories to tell. And I was saying that it's not a good idea, I don't think, to try to use writing a book as a type of therapy. I'd, I'd already done all the therapy and the healing before I started. I didn't use the book as a way of healing myself. I think that's a mistake. Um, it's too public a way to do that. Yeah. But I did understand that I had something to say that maybe other people didn't um, weren't in a position to say at the time. Now, things have really changed, haven't they, in the last few years? So the whole kind of Me Too thing has made an enormous difference to the way people view violence against women and girls and the kind of prevalence, the enormity of the problem has become apparent, hasn't it, to people who didn't really realise what a big problem it was. I mean, it's been translated into quite a few languages um, and I think it's really interesting. It's doing very well in Italy. My Italian edition's doing very well. I've been um, going twice to Italy in November, once to a Luca comic festival which is a really big uh, comics festival and also really pretty Luca I've been there before it's in um, Tuscany so I'm really looking forward to that um, and it's doing really well in Brazil I think so some places where you know um, people are keen to read feminist writing and to discuss the problem of uh, sexual harassment and of um, violence generally you know yeah. so it's been really useful also it's been adopted onto um, in the US the US Canada edition is um, um, published by Arsenal Pulp in Canada um, but in the US it's been adopted onto curriculums and universities and so on um, so it's been it's been really great. It's done done me proud, and also the, my new book, Cree, which is is actually a directly related to this one in some ways because New Writing North, who are a commissioning organisation, who usually commission poetry. Um, and they had read Becoming and Becoming, and they contacted me and said, we really want to commission um, a graphic novel. We've never done one before, but we've read Becoming and Becoming, and we wondered if you'd like to do something about women in County Durham, because... Uh, typically when people think of County Durham they think about the end of the mining industry and they said what we'd really like is a book that's not directly about the end of the mining industry so would you like to meet these 
and this group of amazing women who I've, I think I've made uh, new friends now, so that's really great, who run an empty shop on Front Street in Stanley. And the reason they run the empty shop is obviously, you know, it's an empty shop and they want to fill it with beautiful things that they make in their Cree, uh, which is Durham slang for shed. You know, like somewhere you go that's quiet to make things. Um, so they fill the shop with their stuff, but also they, they, they're escaping all kinds of uh, problems that are indirectly associated with the end of mining, a lot of them. You know, um, some of them have got uh, mental health problems, some of them are uh, struggling with all sorts of difficulties to do, to do with economics or their, or their health. But many of them are escaping domestic violence uh, and so on. So it's a kind of g- very general support group. And it operates around making things, stitching, sewing, uh, drawing things, sticking things, you know, uh, sort of making beautiful little objects for the shop. Got some amazing kind of soft furnishings that they make, tapestries and that kind of thing, uh, quilts. Um, they've got a sewing room as well as the Cree. Um, everything's kind of, well, the, you can see the, uh, I mean, the incredibly bright shop front uh, with Betty Boo. Uh, like a, a huge statue of Betty Boo in the corner um, and this uh, sort of amazing feathery things and things with uh, sort of big blingy diamonds on it's, it's such a uh, kind of joyous sort of celebratory uh, project and really, really think it's a massive privilege to have been introduced to these women and welcomed in so I kind of I just went in and, and uh, joined in with the uh, workshop so the book kind of kind of represents that so it's a, a figure not me a, a fictionalized person yeah. so but it's actually based on one of the younger women that i met when i was at the queen that they're actually mostly uh, sort of middle-aged women i suppose you, you call them but um they, they're all ages um and i decided it should be a journey into the book and then back out again at the other end and it, it's and it, it's a symmetrical book so each book page has, has a twin at the other side, which is a little bit different. Yeah. Not an identical twin. No, but certainly so. Yeah, so every time you see a page that's arranged like this, like this is a, a page of the Durham, the beautiful Durham landscape, and obviously very colourful, you'll find a similar page. Uh, let me see if I can find that one. <laughs> Um, at the other end, let's see, where is it? Oh, well, I found it interesting. There it is. Yeah. The, the difference in style straight away between yeah. the two books is just the colour, but also the, the, the design of it is so different. To it's it's very, cool. very different. Yeah. Also this. I didn't dare. I'm going to get it back Yeah, it's got a concertina fold out. I actually wanted a really complicated origami fold out. But it turned out to be way too, way too expensive. But it was very nice of them to let me do this. Um, and as you can see, this is the kind of simultaneous action in the basement, which is where the Cree happens. Um, and all of the things you see here, these are really there. In the, they've actually moved to a much more glamorous kind of um, site now. And they're opening a cafe. You can't be so, in a cafe. I know, <laughs> so they'll have a shop and a Cree and a centre for counselling and advice, and they'll have a shop. I mean, it's a fantastic project, isn't it? And it revolves around being friends, mm-hmm. putting the kettle on, yeah. like you do, <laughs> stitching stuff together, chatting. Just someone to talk to, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's what it's a lot of people are so stuck about. And I just think it just shows, doesn't it, how simple support yeah. for all sorts of problems can actually be. And I also think it's really interesting that it's based on a men's project, which is called Men's Sheds, which started in Australia. And it was a men's mental health project because it was kind of acknowledged that lots of men do find it really difficult to kind of uh, admit to themselves and to others that they might have a mental health yeah. issue, or they might be feeling lonely, or that they might be feeling God forbid suicidal. And, and it's so uh, to alleviate that kind of problem, men's sheds in Australia revolved around making. Yeah, so here's a space, it's a nice quiet space to come, there'll be other men there, we're going to make stuff. Uh, and then you don't have to talk if you don't want to, there's somebody there if you want to talk to them. Um, and it's kind of spread throughout the world and there are actually men's crees in Durham as well. But this is the women's cree. So obviously really similar, but, but in some ways it really... I think it's just such a fantastic project. So simple. 
Yeah. Yes, and I think that's the thing because, like, my other book on sanity, which I don't know if you've got, which is about my mum who had a very serious mental health issue, um, a psychosis, and she needed, you know, she needed to be sectioned and, and she takes antipsychotic medication. I mean, she needed real, kind of, quite complicated and long term medical treatment and other kinds of support. But not everyone who's got a, a mental health issue needs all of that. Sometimes they really do just need support, which, which can be just the warmth of other people and nice things to do and, you know, a little bit of emotional support. So sometimes it's complicated, sometimes it is complicated, but sometimes it's really simple. And that's what Cree's about. This is what a myriad is particularly good at. Having these books that I, I would never read if it was a novel. I wouldn't sit down and, and read a novel, but having it in a graphic form yeah. brings so many new ideas and I've learned so much from these books that like I That's say, good I to hear. wouldn't have read it before. And it brings it to life as I think the difference that drawing makes is that it really brings it to life. You can really see that these are human beings. Yes. Especially in the Cree book. I mean each of my books has got becoming and becoming is a kind of mad sort of cycle through black lines, isn't it? You know? It's kind of an inky yeah. experiment almost. And that's what's at the heart of that one. At the heart of this is the colour, Cree. At the heart of Cree is the colourful nature of the shop and the things that the women are making. But also the amazing Durham countryside, which I've never seen before. Absolutely gorgeous place. And at the heart of Unsanity is this house, which so it's like a, almost, although it's about me and my mum, it's actually an architectural kind of project because it's a little journey around my grandfather's house where my mum was staying when she was uh, ill. So I, I, I like to have a kind of core concept. And I think that's a really, you know, when you're telling these really difficult stories that myriad yeah. editions are really so good, good at yeah. telling... I think that's the hook, isn't it? The visual cues that you've got. They really help people to um, to access the difficult... I mean, thinking about Ben's book, Ben's uh, New Jerusalem book. It's, uh, uh, you know, obviously we've got something in common because we're both kind of thinking about PTSD yeah. in, in, in our work and... Um, yeah, if you told somebody, oh, oh, yeah, it's a book about PTSD, I can imagine the response might be, oh, oh, I don't want to read that. But it's such a lovely, no. touching, human story. And the drawings of the boy, especially, I really like. Yeah, it's what, 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 what you can get across the feelings, the emotions, without having to write them down. The pictures will come and tell you, but you can't get... Absolutely. Absolutely. If you wrote it as a knockdown, it's not going to get that. The pages or pages of trying to get that. Yeah, you don't get the empathy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you do from very, very talented writers. <laughs> yeah. When you've got loads of people like me as well, I'm not going to sit and read a fit book. I can yeah, relate really, to yeah, and, yeah. You know, it's, it's so much easier to enjoy yeah. and understand. And Absolutely. And they should be for everybody, shouldn't yes. they? Yeah. I mean, mine are maybe not the very young <laughs> no, readers. But I'd say they're all for maybe 14 plus, you know. I um, think, as I kept saying, particularly about the facts of life as well, it's men. Men need to be picking this yeah. stuff up. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. It's, it's fine, well, I get lots of messages yeah. from men who yeah, don't saying thank you. Yeah, enjoy it, I got yeah. one really interesting email from someone who said, Thank you so much yeah. for your book. I really enjoyed it. I'm looking at my friends very differently. I'm looking at some of my friends very differently. I thought, oh, wow, that's a result, yeah. isn't it? And then I get lots of messages from people who've got daughters yeah. saying, oh, do, you, is she, do you think she's old enough to read it? What shall I say to her? You know, is there anything else that I can read? Because I feel like I've learned such a lot. You know, could you... And, so, and I do actually always reply to every email I get. Sometimes there's a little delay yeah, before I get round to it. But um, I get such interesting uh, messages from people about becoming unbecoming. Yeah. And also on sanity as well, my mum is still going around talking to people about her. She, she, just, she gave a public talk in Leeds last week at the Love Art Leeds Festival, yeah. And so she kind of goes and she's got a speech that she's got written down. She has to kind of read it. I mean, she's 75, you know. But, um, yeah, it's really interesting to hear from someone who's been treated under a section for a psychosis, who's sitting there, not quite fine, but well, and with a good... A solid life that she's enjoying yeah that she's been enjoying for a decade now so I think that's really it's a powerful thing to hear 
And the, the Cree book, I think it's... Um, I haven't had it, it's only been out a week, so I haven't had any messages about it, but I think it's going to be important again. Because, um, the, you know, the North East, it, it's got a lot of problems, and it's really nice to be able to kind of draw attention to this lovely project that's happening in Stanley. And then all those missing pieces of history. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, no, thank you. It's really nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm slightly hungover, so hopefully my questions will not be terrible. <laughs> that's, that's, why would you be hungover? That's disgusting. I know. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> what, what kind of state is that? <laughs> right, OK. So we're with Ben Dixon now. New Jerusalem. Yes. We read this. Absolutely mm. love this book, didn't yeah. we? It was just... So it just pulled you in from thank the start. Yeah. What... what why did you create this story? What, what pulled you to, to do this book? Um, I wanted to do a story that felt really personal. Um, it's not autobiographical in any way, but I wanted to write a story that felt like it could be. Um, and uh, my dad had told me stories about uh, how he played on bomb sites as a child, and uh, I was really entranced by that story because it's a very unique thing in history it could only have happened at a particular time um, and there are a few other uh, elements that came in to the story as well um, uh, like for example I've been reading a lot about um, the uh, birth of the welfare state and uh, the time in 1945 and the general election that happened then and the kind of massive sea change of society that happened after the war and also you know I've, I've done various work with um, mental health uh, uh, charities and things like that and it's, it's, it all just kind of suddenly coalesced one day into, into an idea, you know, the, the way these things happen it's like, it's like a sudden car crash of ideas and suddenly you've got this, this thing um, and uh, when that happened, around the same time I've been talking a lot with uh, particularly Carrie Fransman and, and Hannah Berry about their work and they've both been telling me for quite some time and at times quite forcefully that I should just draw my own work because <laughs> um, you know they, they thought my artwork was quite good and I was quite a little un underconfident about it and they just like no you have to do this yourself mm -hmm. and so I eventually took their advice and just um, went for it well yeah yeah but the story itself when I mean, you say it's, it's about bomb sites you know it's, it's got sort of multiple kinds of, it's got bullying in there you've got the, yeah. the issues with PTSD as well yeah how did you find putting that all as a story because there's so many different parts to this book I feel it was a really weird experience because it was actually the in terms of writing the script it was one of the easiest ones I've ever done because I'd accidentally done all the research already um, okay. it's like all the pieces were there and had been there for some time and they just kind of needed to be slotted together and then suddenly it, it was all there so like the, the stuff about uh, my dad playing on bomb sites he told me over dinner like years ago um, and I just remembered that. And then the stuff about um, you know PTSD and the kind of charity work I'd done was brought back to me when I watched, around the same time, I watched um, uh, a, a YouTube video with Patrick Stewart talking about his experience with his father who'd come home from the Second World War with PTSD. And around the same time, I watched um, Ken Loach's The Spirit of 45. And that's really what made the whole thing coalesce. Um, so it was kind of these... A lot of it was just serendipity, but it, it it was all there already. I just kind of sat down and just wrote it, and and once I started writing, it all just kind of poured out on, on onto the page. And so I actually structured the story in about. It only took me about a week to actually structure the story, and then I put it away for a while. Um, and about three months later, I came back to it, and I wrote uh, the, the the script, and I wrote it in about two weeks. Um, and I only ever did one draft of it, and I've never done that before or since. Um, it was it was strange, but it, it didn't. It, it was everything was there already. Um, yeah, I don't. I can't really explain it any better than that, unfortunately, because I don't really understand it myself. <laughs> it was just kind of all there. Brilliant. And one final thing: the, the ending, without giving spoilers, when yeah. I read the book, the ending was quite shocking. Mm, good. Cleverly <laughs> done. Did you, was that just again just written straight off, or did you have to think about how you were going to play that and with, with the different thoughts on how you should finish the book? Or Yeah, um, I, I played with a couple of different ideas, but I, I 
I'm the, I'm the kind of writer that I, I never really start unless I know how it's going to end. And I'm, I'm always driving the characters towards their ending. I, I, I really struggle with the idea of starting a story if I don't know how it's going to finish, because I, I, that to me is a really scary experience. It's like getting in a car and, and driving and not knowing where you're going to end up. You know, It's like, no, I want to know where I'm actually driving to. Um, so... Yeah, once I actually sat down and wrote the script, I knew exactly where it was going to end. Um, but I, I kind of felt like it had to end where it did. I, d- I, could, I don't feel there was any other Definitely real option to me. Hit you. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. But, I mean, some people feel... I know I've, I've heard it said that people felt that the ending is, is very... Uh, Pes- pes- not pessimistic, maybe it's the wrong word, but a punch in the gut, yeah. But, um, but the very end, like the, the kind of epilogue, I'm very, I'm hoping that that's actually quite a hopeful epilogue. Oh, it is. You know? it is. Yeah. The so whole it's, ending is deserved. Yeah. Sense, yeah. But you don't expect it. Good. That's, okay. that's the way to sort of okay. So I'm hoping it's kind of a bittersweet ending. That's really what I was aiming for. If you've not read it and know what we're talking about, you've got to read the book. Now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all very simple. cryptic, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely brilliant. Thank you for having the chat. Thank you. Love the book. Um, what's next? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I've just finished a script um, about uh, the Munich crisis of 1938. And uh, basically, I, I wanted to do a book about Neville Chamberlain and his period of prime, as being prime minister because he's really vilified. He's, really, he's a character who's really not not fared well through history um, and I f- I'm really fascinated by that like the characters who are really kind of um, you know almost looked at as, as worse than um, you know like the greatest villains of history is this, this one character um, and so I'm really fascinated by exploring that but and also giving him a fair hearing so it's a book about him and his period of Prime Minister, but told from his point of view, um, and also explaining how and why we went to war in the first place. So I'm a little bit stuck in the war at the moment. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that will hopefully be out some point uh, end of next year, with a bit of luck, or possibly early year after. We're not sure at the moment, but yeah. it's being drawn at the moment. But, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fully funded project, so it, it will happen. Yeah. So, but that should be the next one for Super. me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ian is best known as a, a crime novelist, but has dipped his toes into comics a few times with the Constantine graphic novel Dark Entries, and more recently a ten-page story in the Traces of the Great War anthology that's being launched this weekend. Uh, John Wagner has been writing comics most of his life, uh, many of which have involved crime. Obviously, his very long running stint on Judge Dredd, as well as other uh, strips published uh, in Rebellion and by other British publishers. Um, I thought I might start off uh, with your formative years, um, because the age of 12 seems to be an important age for both of you. Uh, John, it was when you, from America to the UK, which I guess establishes your kind of mid-Atlantic tone as a writer, and uh, Ian, according to Rankin on Rebus, at the age of 12, uh, you gave up comics and started buying music instead. Um, So I was wondering what kind of comics you read before the age of 12, and how long you went cold turkey for. Uh, I, I think that, that, that must be a misprint, surely. I didn't stop reading comics. I stopped thinking that I could be a comics book writer and illustrator. Because the first things I ever wrote were comics. I mean, I'd get bits of paper and fold them in half to make four-page booklets. Um, and I would have, you know, four, four strip stories, one on each page, um, breaking it up into tiny wee squares with tiny wee stick people. And I would put a free gift on the front. <laughs> I, would, uh, I would make a badge or something with a bit of cardboard, shape a bit of cardboard and put a bit of a, a safety pin and a sellotape on the back and stick it on the front going, free gift this week. Because all comics had free gifts back in the 60s. That's why you bought them. <laughs> um, and, you know, there'd be a sports story and maybe a space story and stuff like that, um, limited to one copy of each. But I think by about the age of 12, I'd got much more interested in music and thought, no, I'm never going to be a comics book guy. I'm going to be a rock star yeah. or a pop star. <laughs> so I then focused my attention on writing uh, lyrics uh, for non-existent bands and, and forming a top 10 every week, which meant nine other bands <laughs> and all the personnel. And then taking the bands on tour and designing our album sleeves. 
and doing pretty much what I'd been doing when I was trying to do comics, which is create an, an alternative universe where I could continue to play God. <laughs> nice. Um, and John, when you were, were growing up, were you buying American comics when you uh, lived in America? And then did that no, switch? no, we, we, okay. couldn't, we couldn't afford the comics. I, I read a few that other people had, uh, Batman, Superman. Uh, I wasn't particularly interested in comics, then, uh, hmm. mainly because I didn't see many of them. The one I did identify with was Uncle Scrooge, <laughs> because of my <laughs> Scottish ancestry. And I always felt there was some kinship there. <laughs> Although I never made his kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> but while you were making comics, was there also a point where you started reading them as well? Oh, yeah, well, I started reading them when I, in Greenock, I got a paper round. Mm. And before you went out, you had probably half an hour, so I would read all the comics from the shelf. And then uh, walking round, I would read other people's comics and stick these tatty, dog-eared things in mm -hmm. the post box when I'd finished with them. So I did, that's when my comic reading started, really. Yeah, I mean, I'd grown up, I grew up in a little mining village in Fife in Scotland in the 60s, and my parents had left school at 14, 15, didn't read books, really. Um, but comics were affordable literacy. I'm interested to hear John say that his family couldn't afford them because, you know, a couple of pennies uh, could get you one of the DC Thompson comics. And I mean, I started off probably with a bimbo, you know, before I could walk. And then it was straight into um, Bino and Dandy and, and Topper and Whizzer and Chips and all that, segueing nicely into Hotspur and Victor and then Lion and Tiger, which were a bit more expensive, but were more adult material, I guess, mm. kind of more grown-up stories. And then 2000 AD eventually came along when I was in my teens, um, and that grabbed me as well. So there was that continuum, and it was I think we spoke about it a wee bit yesterday in at least one of the panels, about it being a, 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 a rung of the literacy ladder that was going to take mm. you to the next step, you know? And, um, and I just was, I had a huge collection of comics. It was the American ones were frustrating because our local grocers, they were all hanging up on a clothesline above the counter with clothes pegs. <laughs> and you would go, I'll, I'll take that one. And it would be Spider-Man. But then you would miss the following three or four yeah, issues right, yeah. and then jump back in again. So you never, I never quite was up to speed on what, uh, how these, how these storylines were, um, were going were to end or were going to continue. Um, so I was much more keen on the DC Thompson school because, mm. because they came, you know, they were in the news agents every week and every week you'd go and get them. And it was my, probably my first, because um, people sometimes say there's not many, I mean, we're here today to talk about <laughs> it, there's not many detectives in comics, there's not much, or there never used to be much in the way of detective stuff in comics. Um, Judge Dredd it kind of started to break the mould to a certain extent. But one of them, and it was either Tiger or Lion, I forget, had Zip Nolan. And Zip That's Nolan right, was a yeah. two or three page that actually had physical clues in oh. the pictures, and Zip Nolan as Highway Cop would solve it at the end, and he would say, "Can you have you seen what Zip Nolan has seen? Can you solve this this story?" And, and that was probably the first time I ever came across that notion that you could do a kind of who done it with red herrings and clues in a really tight three, two or three page comic strip. Mm. I actually wrote one or two of those. There you go. <laughs> After the first three or four clues, you kind of run out of good <laughs> visual <laughs> clues that you can give people. I think the thing about comics in, in Britain is that compared to American comics, they were cheap. Mm. I mean, tuppence, thruppence, back in the old days. So that made them quite accessible. Mm. So uh, it was far easier to read not just one, but quite a few. Mm. Well, and, I mean, if we look at your earlier strips, John, the, um, I guess gritty is a word that would work for a lot of the artwork. And I guess that's because uh, British comics, until about the mid-80s, were printed on such cheap uh, paper that the art would have to be really, you know, yeah. kind of bold and in your face in order for it to be reprinted uh, legibly. Did that kind of affect the sort of storytelling that you were doing? Um, no, I don't think I, I worried too much mm. about that. I mean... To me, the story was always the essential thing, and then I'd leave the art to the artist or the editor. It, it, uh, uh, I didn't often get to choose what artist I was working with. It was mandated, you'll be doing this with mm. Cruz or whoever. So it's only since 2000 AD started that you actually got to collaborate more with artists and yeah. to, to work together with a particular artist that you liked. Well, I was going to say someone like Arthur Ransom, yeah. you know, when the paper stock did improve, then you could actually have this beautiful... Oh, yes, artwork. yeah, yeah. It, does, it does make a difference, yeah. Mm. Um, so, Ian, in terms of comics that uh, were perhaps formative 
uh, for you as a writer. I read an interview with you um, a few years ago and you mentioned the work of Alan Moore, which is why um, a couple of Swamp Thing covers are in rotation on this PowerPoint. Was it um, British writers who were working on American comics like John, like Alan Moore, like others, who perhaps fed into your imagination more? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was that, that lovely thing that happened, the British invasion, um, where a lot of the people who had been working on 2000 AD suddenly crossed the Atlantic, either physically or their work crossed the Atlantic, and then started to feed back into the UK again. And I remember it well, 1986, I was 26, I just got married, moved to London, living in Tottenham, and there was a comic shop uh, at Seven Sisters, and I went along to the comic shop in Seven Sisters, and the guy there just struck up a friendship with him. And he would just turn me on to all these different, you know, all these new things that were happening. I, you know, Watchmen. He said, mm. you know, check out Watchmen, um, number one. He said, you know, in fact, I think he gave me number two. And I said, have you got number one? He went, yeah, I've got one. I've still got <laughs> one left of that. Uh, and you know, and and so I can. And I went, oh, Alan Moore. He's the guy from 2000 AD. Mm. You know, uh, who used to do the kind of time twisters and things, which I'd really loved. And DR and Quinch, which I'd really loved. Um, <laughs> And, but 2000 AD was hugely important um, from my kind of mid to late teens on. In fact, my wife is still furious with me because on her wedding day, Saturday morning, she went to the hairdressers to get her hair done. I went out and bought 2000 AD, as usual, to get it read before the wedding because uh, I thought probably not going to get it read this afternoon, so I better get it done this morning. Um, uh, but it was that kind of thing. It was that kind of you know, weekly fix and, uh, uh, and exciting new voices. And actually the start of seeing crime and, and, and people who solve crime uh, back in comics again, Judge Dredd, Robo Hunter. There were a, kind of, a few of them around that kind of had that, the, the, the template was a template of the, the who done it or the thriller or the crime story, uh, but doing really interesting things with them. Mm. Well, and also, I mean, you know, thinking of your work, John, having that mid Atlantic voice, that seems to be something that has always sort of influenced Judge Dredd. People talk of Dirty Harry as being one of the early inspirations, yeah. you know, a cop who can operate beyond, you know, the boundaries of the law. Was that sort of freedom to create a world where the boundaries of justice can be sort of evolving from story to story, something that appealed? Oh, oh yeah, and the uh, thing about Judge Dredd was the story was too wide and all-encompassing, I thought, to set it in Britain. Britain was too small. It needed the space and, and the bigness and the extremities of the United States, or what was the United States. Mm for the story to work properly, which yeah. is why when I came to do Strontium Dog, I made sure to set that in Britain as a sort of main nice. balance. But, um, yeah, the, the opportunities for, for stories in uh, a city like Mega City One um, are just immense. Uh, actually, I saw Mega City One uh, when I went to Istanbul. I don't know if anyone's <laughs> been to Istanbul, but it, just seems to go on and on and on with bigger and bigger buildings. You go around the corner, there's more of it. Mm. It, it just, I thought, this is Mega City One, this is what it's like. Mm. And also, I guess it's the classic sci fi trope that when you have buildings that tall, and I guess you get it in the real world as well, that the ultra rich are at the top and the ultra poor are at yeah. the bottom, and that inequality yeah. leads to crime, you know, to start yeah. off with. Usually with a separate entrance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, used to, I mean, I used to love that when I was reading the Judge Dredd ones with notes and all the in-jokes, but also seeing that a lot of it set in the future was really talking about stuff that was happening in here and now. So this notion of people who just lived in their cars or their, their kind of, um, Winnebago's that just drove around endlessly on an automatic drive because they couldn't afford housing. <laughs> you go, that's kind of where we are uh, as a society. People are living out of their cars, um, not just in the US but elsewhere. Um, and the problems with things like uh, uh, violence, street art, graffiti, you name it. Um, and obesity. I just love the Kenny, the eating, uh, yeah, the eating competitions. I just, yeah, just phenomenal. And then, you know, a few years down the line, you go, that's kind of where we are as a, as a society. And uh, that's what the British authors seem to, a lot of them, and artists seem to bring to the comics was that, that sense of, um, you know, quite right on satire. Mm. You know, it was, uh, it, was, it was poking, it was pointing the finger at us and saying, you, know, you realise that although this is, you think it's set in the future, it's actually talking about you. Mm. Yeah. Alan Grant had a theory that uh, the reason Judge Dredd didn't go down quite so well in America was because the things we were depicting in Dredd were already happening over there. It was, it was nothing special, nothing. That, that was their life, you know, belly wheels and mm. all, all sorts. It's, uh, and it's, then I guess as real life becomes more extreme, then Dredd has to become more extreme yeah. to respond to that. Yeah. I mean, you've said in the past, John, that um, the favourite strip of yours uh, in the Judge Dredd, Judge Dredd world that you wrote was America, uh -huh. where I think 
for the first time, at least on an extended narrative, it's actually the characters within Mega City One that the story focuses on, and how everyday lives are actually crushed by the justice system. Yeah, yeah. Well, it. Uh, I wanted something really broad and sweeping that covered uh, the whole existence of Mega City One and what it was like to actually grow up in a city like that. Mm. So, uh, Dread became a sort of peripheral character, a kind of shadow in the background, uh, which I, I, I quite often, we, Alan and I have written stories where Dread doesn't appear, mm. and we still call them Judge Dread, which is uh, good that you can do that with a character, because partly the city is the character as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, and even visually, right from the start of America, where you have the um, statue of the Justice Department towering over the Statue of Liberty, you know, from that very simple but very mm. effective visual, you're showing how the justice system in Mega City One, even if it doesn't actually mm. work in terms of, you know, the millions and millions of people who yeah. work there, is this oppressive figure. Yeah, well, look around the world and how many situations like that are there, you know, how many countries are ruled in that way, mm. probably more than are not. Uh, it's It's... Dred's law exists, <coughs> sadly. Ian, you were talking about how satire is an effective tool in comics, and indeed the first graphic novel, uh, and hopefully first of many, uh, <laughs> that you wrote, um, Dark Entries, uh, sees John Constantine entering the Big Brother house. So I guess you know, you've got some satire right there, because I, perhaps I'm not the only person who has thought watching Big Brother or these other kind of reality shows, this would be far more entertaining if there was a monster or a serial killer in the house. Absolutely, the absolutely, yeah. <laughs> You're, they're not all going to make it out alive. I mean, that was it. That was what appealed to me, was you've got this closed set that's under 24-hour surveillance. How can people be disappearing or being bumped off? What is going on? Um, and you think it's some kind of poltergeist activity, so of course you call for John to come in and, and enter the house, uh, uh, apparently as a, as, a, as a new housemate, but actually looking to see you know, what's going on. And then, spoiler alert, turns out the whole thing's happening in hell uh, for the entertainment of the folk that are trapped in hell. And, um, uh, and he's got to try and get out again. Uh, I, you know, I just, I, I love the idea of it. They, they, a very go approached me, it was a long time ago now, and they said, from all the interviews you've done, we know that you're a big fan of comic books and always have been. We're going to do this new series called Vertigo Crime. You can bring us a brand new story or you can use one of our existing characters. And I was desperate to write about Constantine because um, right from his first appearance in uh, Swamp Thing, I was very, I'm, I'm much more, as a fan of, the, of, of comics, I'm much more interested in humans than, than aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he's such a, a, a flawed uh, human being who also happens to be a private eye, who also happens to have, of course, a bit of the supernatural in him. Um, so, he, you know, Alan Moore had grabbed me from the get-go when he appeared in Swamp Thing and then when Jamie Delano started the, 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 the Hellblazer series, I just thought, wow, this is amazing stuff. Um, and, and that night, I did the gumshoe. Yeah. I was really interested in, but taking it a wee bit further uh, in a way that you couldn't do with something like uh, the kind of Humphrey Bogart type figure. It's interesting that I'm sitting next to the man who also did the bogeyman, yeah. uh, <laughs> where we take that kind of, the trope of the kind of, Humphrey Bogart as the gumshoe kind of thing, as the kind of uh, private eye figure, but actually then make it a guy who's escaped from a special hospital <laughs> who just thinks he's Humphrey Bogart in one of those films. It's an absolute genius. Um, the bogeyman, I remember when I first got it, I just couldn't help laughing. And I think that first thing when he's naked at the bus stop in Glasgow, and it's a wee woman there with her shopping bags, and it's Bucket Moraine, and he's naked, having escaped from the asylum, and she's gone, Oh, you're poor wee todger, you must be frozen. <laughs> <laughs> I go, This is going to go some interesting places, this story. You know? I love that. Uh, and I, you know, I like books that, where you can actually see, you can see the, 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 the bones of the, the inspiration. Mm. You know? And maybe in Judge Dredd, you can see it a wee bit with the kind of Clint Eastwood figure. Um, yeah, uh, you know, in, in Robo Hunter is probably a wee bit of uh, Blade Runner, um, but I just loved that, and I loved it about Constantine that he was that kind of down at heel, tired, cynical gumshoe, but he was so much more, so much more, and that was always what appealed to me about the comics that I read. Were you ever asked to to come back and do more? Because a fellow uh, Scots crime writer, Denise Mina, had a run on the comic. Yeah, she did. She had a really good run on, on Hellblazer, and then she went off and did Girl with a Dragon Tattoo and stuff as well. Um, I wasn't very interested in adapting other people's work. Mm. Um, and, I mean, yeah, they said to me, Vertigo said right from the get-go, if you've got anything else, come back to us. And I never got anything else. Oh. So, so far, I haven't come back to them. I did a tiny wee comic for um, Mark Miller for a short-run thing he did called Clint mm. that he, he sort of put together with um, Jonathan Ross. 
and you know why they called it Clint. <coughs> um, it's the one name you're not supposed to use in comics because of how it looks when it's written on the page, uh, how it can be mis- misconstrued as a capital letters. So that's why they called her Comic Clint. And I did one for him, and, uh, and, and I've done a couple of other wee bits and pieces. Um, and worked on this one, Rory Gallagher, uh, the blues guitarist, rock guitarist Rory Gallagher, was a huge fan of pulp and crime mm. uh, and thrillers. And his brother, to keep his legacy alive, um, said, I'm going to put together a compilation album of all these songs that he did that were influenced by mm. Dashiell Hammett and various other writers. Um, and he got me to do a short story set in the 1930s in LA, and then he got uh, Tim Truman to do the oh, to do nice. the art to go with it, and this is the cover of the album. Mm. And uh, it was it was just brilliant fun, and we got Aidan Quinn, the actor, to narrate the story and stuff. And it was a lovely package, and I think it was very true to the things that Rory Gallagher was passionate about. Have you ever considered doing something for 2000 AD? Uh, no. No, but if then, you were asked, would you? Well, yeah, they've not asked yet, so there I'm you sure go. I'm sure they will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If Matt Smith is listening. Yeah, yeah. I'll Who mention knows? it to him. I'm sure he'll love <laughs> something. Well, I mean, as an ex-editor of 2000 AD, David Bishop, I see him almost every day because he mm-hmm. teaches at um, Napier uh, University in Edinburgh. And, and so I see him in the cafe because I, I live around the corner from Napier. Pretty much every day we bump into yeah. each other. And uh, we have some interesting conversations about comics. That's a creative writing course that actually specialises in genre uh, and and comics and stuff. Mm. So it's a it's a because creative writing it used to be really snooty at universities. You know, they want to, you want to be the next Ian McEwan or the next mm. Martin Amis or something. Uh, and now they've gone. Well, what if you don't? What if you actually want to be a commercial writer? Mm. And so they're they're focusing on that, which I think was a really, a really. I wish it had been around when I was young. Mm. You know, I mean, this is a thing. Living in a, a working class coal mine in town in Fife, it wanted to be a writer. You went, how do I do it? Yeah. There's no classes. I don't know anybody who's a writer. I don't know how to go about this. I wouldn't have not had the first idea how to send these cartoons off into the wilderness mm. or these mm. write this little bits, bits of writing I was doing. It was only when I got to Edinburgh University that I started to meet other people who were interested in being writers and we started to work out how we could get a toehold in that industry. Yeah. I mean, if I'd known you could just go up and chap on the door of DC Thompson, I would have done it. <laughs> but I didn't. Dundee was a mystery to me. You know, it was a mysterious place on the other side of the water. So I never went near Dundee. Uh, and I've, I've stuck to that as a, as a rule of thumb. <laughs> uh, John, Ian mentioned uh, The Bogeyman, and that's uh, obviously one of your comics where, like he said, the influences are at large, the kind of noir characters played by Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. In terms of those kind of noir influences and other kind of crime narratives, what sort of stories did you enjoy as a writer that perhaps reflected in your work? Well, I think a lot of that was based after... Alan and I did a Robert McKee course Mm. uh, where he focuses a lot on Casablanca. Mm. And uh, I don't know whether it was before or after, but a lot of it was based around Casablanca. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's such a good film, it's really interesting to play off it. and You get a lot of material out of it. uh, And it, it was also... There weren't many comics about Scotland, and we wanted to do one. And uh, influenced by John McShane, who then ran ACA Books and Comics, who wanted to produce something that was... We actually... We did use the story, uh, use the character, in an eagle story. Hmm. And we thought, this is too good to waste. Hmm. So we withdrew the story and held it back and created the bogeyman out of that. Hmm. And obviously, you know, crime is a constant um, feature in a strip like Dread. But thinking of other stories that you've written that are more fully kind of located within the crime drama, um, I'm a big fan of both uh, History of Violence in its dreadful movie edition, which we have here. Um, I can't believe that they would release a comic with no yeah. images yeah. on the outside cover, but we'll skip over that. Well, um, in the, on the third cover, they actually used an image from the movie that isn't in the book. Brilliant. <laughs> um, the History of Violence and uh, The Button Man um, that yeah. we have uh, on screen, both of which, compared to perhaps the more surrealistic, more satirical violence that you see in Dread, are far more about the devastating impact of real life violence. Mm. That, w- those, that was obviously a subject you It was a change with. for me to write something with that kind of realism. I, I, I really enjoyed it, especially uh, The Button Man as well. It, uh, when you're writing fantasy, part of the trouble is that there aren't any rules. 
And it's interesting to write something where the rules are all laid out. There are certain possibilities. Certain you, you can't just suddenly grow a pair of wings or whatever and get out of a situation. All the rules, are, you know them. Mm. It's life. And it's, that was really interesting to write about that. I mean, we're, 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 you know, John's sitting here um, uh, in part because, it, well, because Ed Bre Brubaker couldn't make it um, for personal reasons. Um, but, you know, I, I, w looking at what's happening in comics just now, um, people like him and Sean Phillips and we're doing stuff like Criminal and Fatal to a certain extent. Mm. Um, uh, and, there's a, you know, there's a kind of whole stream of kind of Gotham set uh, crime stories, and they're proper crime stories. They, they go back to the kind of roots of noir uh, and the roots of film noir, uh, and, and the roots of American kind of pulp fiction, mm. pulp novels. And I think that's really exciting, especially when you see them brought up to date. It's a really great Krista Faust one just now called Peep Land, which is set, I mean, it's basically, um, uh, well, it's, it's set in the world of strip shows and peep shows and all that in central New York in the, in, uh, in the, in the, you know, towards the end of the 20th century. But it's got this great sense of kind of lives that are going nowhere. Mm. And that sense of, that sense you always must get in noir that this is not going to end well. Uh, no matter how much hope you bring along during the course of the story, this just ain't going to end well. And, uh, which is kind of slightly depressing, but then you go, yeah, that kind of is real life for most of us. You know, life doesn't end well no. for any of us. Uh, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Uh, but I just love that. I love that, that idea that everybody's doomed, but we can enjoy the ride. <laughs> Um, allowing for your marriage vows to having to hold to put up with my subscription to the galaxy's greatest comic um, how large is your comic collection? Uh, you know what I mean it, it, uh, I lost a lot of them for a while I mean all my early ones when I was a kid got thrown out when I left at home uh, or my sister gave them to her pals or whatever they all went um, all the early 2000 ADs and the Victors and the Hotspurs and everything else and the various American comics costing sixpence all went um, and I did have a fairly big collection, and then, you know, during various moves, I thought I'd lost them. Then I found them in a trunk or in a box, which was exciting. But I'm afraid some of them, some of them have had to be winnowed out because we're downsizing <coughs> next year. My wife and I are downsizing from a big house to a small flat. And so the charity shops of Edinburgh <laughs> at the moment are awash with, with some, of my, some of my comics. Uh, some of them, of course, you can't bear. You're never going to give them away. Um, and some of them you go, well, I, can always, I can always read that digitally. If I really want to reread it, I can get it, I can reread it. Um, so it's just taken up a lot of space. Um, but I know a lot of you know, I just go, uh, and it is, it's been a horrible few months for me. I had to get rid of a lot of my books, a lot of my LPs and CDs, uh, and just, you know, various paraphernalia. Um, manuscripts and stuff are all going to the National Library of Scotland, so they're safe. Uh, but yeah, but there's a bunch of stuff I could never give away. The Alan Moores, the, the, the Delanos, the, 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 the Bogeyman, you know, that are all sitting there. Um, the, the early Neil Gaiman's. Neil Gaiman I'd forgotten until I was thinking about this event, but I mean, was it his first book, Violent Cases? It was yeah. definitely Dave McKean's first. Yeah. Was, it, was a crime story. I mean, it was about Al Capone. doesn't get much more crime than that, <laughs> you know. And, um, and a lot of people, you know, when you go back to their early works, you find that there's a lot of uh, um, crime, mm. you know, in the, in the margins or at the back of what they're doing. Mm. I mean, Ian has previously talked about how Edinburgh is a big influence on him as a creator, you know, all the possibilities of the city. Are there any locations, John, that have particularly kind of inspired you as a writer? Um, no, I can't say there are. Uh, <laughs> New York, probably. Mm. Uh, it's uh, such an exciting city, so much goes on there. But uh, uh, no, most of my stuff is set in this unknown future, mm. which... Uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't particularly have any bearing on any particular place. Mm. Having said which, Bogeyman is a great novel about it, about Glasgow. Oh yes, yeah, it certainly was. It was it was our intention to make that as true to Glasgow as we could. The characters and the whole feel of the, the language, story. The language. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I think the gritty black and white art too mm. was. Uh, so yeah, you could say Glasgow. That was, I, was sitting, I was chuckling away at it, going, I wonder what people reading this in America are going to make of this, you know, because <laughs> uh, some, some of the words are very particularly Scots. And I, I know the problem I've got with my novels, just trying to get them past an editor in London. He'll say, what does hee-haw mean? <laughs> you know, and I'll go, well, it's Scots rhyming slang for fuck all. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> um, you know, I don't think we can use that, Ian. We, you know. And in America, then, they change it again. In America, um, when I, I'll get the books back <coughs> from the States, 
and I'll have changed it so Rebus is walking down the sidewalk, choking oh, the right, trunk yeah. of his car. Oh, you know, uh-huh. um, and it's just you go, that's just horrible. Mm. And then American fans come to Edinburgh looking for Rebus's Edinburgh, and they can't find it. You know, because Flesh Market Close, which is a real street, has been changed in America to Flesh Market Alley. Uh-huh. Uh, and they go, what? Why did you change it? And I go, because publishers think you're idiots. Basically, <laughs> and I mean, readers aren't idiots. Readers are the opposite of idiots. That's why they're readers. And, and they want all these cultural nuances, and they mm. want to have to work a wee bit yeah. to find out what this all means. Mm. I think my favourite one recently, though, was, and this is often a terrible tangent, but I got back a Rebus novel that had been translated into French, and what they do in France is if they don't understand a cultural reference, um, they keep it in the original language and put a wee footnote to explain it to the reader in French. <laughs> and it was Rebus saying to somebody, I get the feeling we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Which is a line from quite a well-known film, I would suggest. <laughs> footnote. Oh, footnote. Down at the bottom. And in French it says, Rebus here is referring to the two American AOR bands, Kansas and Toto. <laughs> <laughs> That's Which made no sense at all when you tried to go back in the context. You know, one phone call to me, one email to me would have fixed that. But. Well, in a good story anyway, I mean, if the reader doesn't get the cultural references, then as long as you can follow the story, all it does is actually kind of suggest to you this kind of uh, alien environment that is intriguing, you know. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, if you're thinking of, say, Glasgow in um, The Bogeyman, then it is that whole fish-out-of-water scenario that mm-hmm. actually makes it so appealing. A guy who thinks that he's Humphrey Bogart and adopts that kind of manner of speech and mannerisms when he's surrounded by typical Glaswegians. Yeah. Well, I think we did include a glossary in that. <laughs> did you? <laughs> just the, for readers south of the border. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I've just been dissing the French, and I should apologise, because they've been very good, especially with comics. I moved to France in 1990 and lived there for six years full-time, and every supermarket was full of Bon Désigné. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were, just, they were just passionate about comics and adults thought nothing of reading comics they weren't embarrassed about reading comics mm-hmm. and, they, and they also took on a lot of American uh, right, they, they, they loved American pulp fiction and American noir and not only did they translate those books but a lot of their comic books then reflected that a lot of Ameri- uh, French comics at that time and now were heavily influenced by noir and they also did adaptations of uh, American writers and so you can get a, maybe get a Lawrence Block crime novel adapted as a comic book, but it'll have been done by a French writer and a French artist. Mm. Um, and that, I just think that was that was really thrilling. And uh, when you go to an, an American, uh, sorry, when you go to a French crime writers convention or crime fiction convention, the crossover with comics is extraordinary. Mm. You know, there'll be comics people there, there'll be creators there. Um, mm. they, there's just the lines are blurred. You know, in a way that still hasn't happened with comics in the UK. I'm going to Cheltenham Literary Festival tonight. I doubt there'll be too many comics creators there <laughs> on stage. No. Yeah. You know, there's and always been that divide. Always. I know in the UK. I mean, even for crime writers, we for years you'd go to a literary festival. There'd be no crime writers, um, and if there were, there'd be on a, there'd be two or three crime writers on one panel pushed to a corner. We bit apartheid over here, um, and, and it's and it's lovely that those barriers are beginning to break down in the UK. But we've got a ways to go. Yeah. But that said, you know the idea of comics is a slightly illegitimate genre, where it's it's something that you're almost not meant to talk about or indulge in as an adult. Is that something that's appealed to both of you? It's one of the oldest genres, I think. And mm. Cavemen were drawing comics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's um, it's as valid as any other to me. I don't. I mean, I don't see the difference between comics, film, mm. art. I mean, they're all forms of art. Mm. And none is better than the other. Yeah. I think sometimes uh, it, it's to do with the, the practitioners in each thing. You know, if you get bad comics, then you get a bad impression of comics. But there are so many good ones now, mm. uh, intelligent ones, and a uh, far greater range of subjects. I mean, before the British invasion of the States, they were so centred on superheroes. And I think the Brits sort of opened that mm. up a bit for them. Yeah, and I mean, and the, I mean, the barriers are breaking down um, everywhere. So that I, I mentioned Krista Faust. Krista Faust is an American crime novelist, but she's also starting to write comics. Um, Denise Miner, you've mentioned already, a uh, novelist, but loves comics, loved reading them, and then <coughs> also writes them. Um, and it is Lauren Bukas, who's a South African fantasy writer um, and crime writer, has also started to write uh, comics. Um, and it, it's not because they're just looking for something different, it's because they're passionate about the genre, they're passionate about the form and there's a way of telling a story graphically that you can't ever get when you're doing a novel or a short story um, 
Uh, and, and it's nice sometimes to work collaboratively because if you're a novelist, it's a very, uh, not lonely occupation, but it's a solitary occupation. Mm. And, um, and sometimes when you're working with somebody else, an artist, and you're bouncing ideas off them and you're having a conversation. I just got something similar recently. I did a Reba stage play. It's on in Edinburgh just now. Um, and then touring widely. But I did it collaboratively with a, with a, with a playwright. And, and she would say, look, Ian, you're used to having as many scenes as you need, as many pages as you need, as many characters as you need. We can't do that on the stage. Mm. So you've just got to get that out of your head. <laughs> and this, this story is going to have to be told in dialogue. This story cannot be told narratively. It's got to be told in dialogue. So we, we had to find a new story involving Rebus that was specifically for the stage. But that made me think out of the box. Yeah. And that was the lovely thing about, about being asked to do a graphic novel. Having had no training. I mean, you know, it's a huge privilege to be told, go away and do a graphic novel without having to have earned the right to do it by getting a lot of stuff rejected down the years and learning your craft. And I made a lot of mistakes early on in that. I mean, and when I did the first graphic novel, I made a lot of, you know, I put in far too much... Uh, it was too consecutive. It was like if somebody's opening a door and going in, they'd be a close-up of the hand on the door, <laughs> the door opening, the other side of the door, people watching them. And it would take us like six panels to get somebody to walk in somewhere. Well, that's just more like manga. You know? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but I thought, no, you've, you've only got so many pages in, you can't get away with that. And so we did start to kind of self-edit. And that's really useful um, as a writer to, to remember that, you know, that, that, that brevity is all. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's something um, that your scripts have always been described as, John. I think someone uh, said once that reading a script of yours was like getting a very exciting telegram. <laughs> um, uh, but I guess that's nice because it means that um, it's more like a filmic relationship, that you're writing a script and then you're leaving the direction, the art direction, the casting, all of that to the artist. Very much. A lot of it's down to sheer laziness, of course. <laughs> I don't like to write two sentences and one will do. Sometimes I don't even write a description. I just say, read the dialogue. And a, a good artist, you know, why do you have to tell him what's going on when he can, can see it? So I've always been lucky, or of recent years, lucky to work with really good artists and I know I can rely on them to fill in the what lack of imagination I have with theirs. And uh, so I do rely on them a lot. You know, I, I think of stories in terms of conversations and character interactions, and I leave the great visuals to the great artists that I work with. Mm. I mean, I didn't actually meet any comic book uh, writers or illustrators until after I'd done my first graphic novel. Um, and the only... Tip, well, the only thing I had before I started writing the first script was I had the uh, I had the special edition of well, Watchmen, and that had a kind of few pages of Alan Moore's mm. script. Yeah, apparently that's not typical uh, yeah. in the comic book. You know, it was like it was for one for panel <laughs> panel one of Watchmen. It was like a page and a half of detailed analysis of what he wanted the artist to do, and um, so that was what my script was like to start with. And, and I sent the first few pages off to uh, Vertigo, and I went, "Dear Christ, no! Um, <laughs> you know, um, let's free the artist up a wee bit here. You don't have to put nearly that amount of detail." And then then I got to meet uh, uh, writers and artists, and you know they'd say, "Oh yeah, you just need you just go blam." That's all you need, just blam and let the artist decide what they're going to do with that. Yeah. And uh, a wee bit like the exciting telegram. Um, <laughs> but as a novelist, of course, I'm used to writing screeds. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, at the risk of um, adding two and two together and coming up with five, and again, this is based on my reading uh, Rankin on Readers, um, in, in that you talk about, A, how uh, Jekyll and Hyde was a particular favourite novel of yours uh, growing up, and then as a teenager... Uh, you mentioned coming up with an alter ego as a prog rock star, uh, you know, in your head. And also when you were writing poetry, apparently you had a kind of like an avatar mm. when you were writing those. And comics, particularly American superhero comics, are all about an alternative secret identity. So I was wondering if that was something about the medium that appealed to you. Uh, yeah, probably. probably. I mean, a secret identity, definitely, because, um, you know, I, I arrived at Edinburgh, Edinburgh University and started studying literature, and, and Scottish literature very quickly became apparent to me, was about alter egos and doppelgangers and secret identities. Um, going back to Jekyll and Hyde, uh, I mean, Jekyll and Hyde, written by Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, born and brought up in Edinburgh, and living in these two cities, living in the city of the Enlightenment, the new town, with a kind of rational family who were all scientists and our... Um, you know, uh, they designed lighthouses and stuff, and he was going to be a lawyer. Uh, uh, but he was attracted to the darker side of Edinburgh, the old town, where all the vagabonds, prostitutes, and, and, and junkies hung out. Um, so he would tiptoe up the hill towards the old town at dead of night as a teenager, and then tiptoe back, living in those two worlds. 
Um, and that book, Jekyll and Hyde, was also heavily influenced. It was influenced by two things, really. One, well, more than that, but let's, let's focus on two. One was a real-life character called William Brodie, who was an Edinburgh resident, gentleman by day, deacon of rights, uh, a cabinet maker, etc., etc. By night had a gang, and he would break into your house, which he did with facility because he had fitted the lock. Uh, he would break into your house and he was eventually hanged on a scaffold that he had made himself uh, for his crimes. So gentleman by day, thief by night, good and evil incarnate in the same person. And in Stevenson's childhood bedroom, and it's now in the Writers Museum in Edinburgh, you can go and see it, was a wardrobe built by Deacon William Brodie. And Stevenson's nursemaid would tell him the story of this guy who was good and evil. So that must have got hardwired into his head. And then years later came out. But another influence on Stevenson was a book called Confessions of a Justified Sinner, which is the first serial killer novel, as far as I'm aware. It's about a religious zealot, a young man, uh, who's introduced or who meets one day a charismatic stranger who seems to be a shapeshifter, uh, who tells him that because he's a member of the elect and is going to go to heaven no matter what he does, he can kill people on earth, especially if they disagree with his religion. (laughs) So it's like a kind of, it's like a, a bomber, you know, it's like a terrorist bomber. Uh, has, been set adri- has been set free to go out and kill anybody who disagrees with his religion. Um, and you're never sure if the shapeshifter is the devil, a minor kind of uh, uh, devil, uh, whether it's a figment of his fevered imagination mm. or whether it's just a real psychopath, a charismatic psychopath. You're never entirely sure because it's such a weird narrative. It's a really difficult book to read. So all of that was drip-feeding into me and, mm. and then taking me up to the more present day when you've got somebody like Miss Jean Brodie and Muriel Sparks, Prime Miss Jean Brodie, who seems a very... She's, she's actually related to Deacon William Brodie. She says it herself in the book. Oh. Uh, and, and you're never sure if she's the hero or the villain of that story, because she seems to be a little bit of both. Hmm. Um, uh, and, and so all of these kind of people that, are, that are, seem to be one thing but might be another. Mm. Uh, yeah, so the secret identity, the Batman, the, all this kind of stuff, really did appeal to me. And Doctor Who appealed to me. Hmm. It just kept changing, you know, mm. from, from one year to the next, or one series to the next played by a different actor, going to different places, taking on different personalities, dressing differently to, to blend in with the, with the locals at whatever period in history happens to arrive. Mm. All of that was, you know, for, a, for someone like me who was, I was a shapeshifter, I think all writers are and all novelists are, but living in Carden Den, I'd be writing poems to girls I couldn't talk to <laughs> and then keeping them under the bed and then going and hanging around the street corner with the Doc Martens and the Harrington jacket pretending to be tough. And then when the local Neds all went off to fight the next village along, we were called, uh, uh, we were called YCD, Young Card and Den. They were called the YLM, the Young Lock Yelly Mental. And they were much harder than us. So when they all went off to fight each other, I would say, I've just got to go home. And I'd go, <laughs> home and, I'd go home and write about it in my bedroom and then tuck it under the bed again where my mum couldn't find it. So there was that kind of secret Ian. There was that doppelganger already there. Mm-hmm. And if I'd, if I'd gone out to the streets of a Card and Den and said, by the way, folks, I'm writing poetry... I would have been beaten to a pulp. You know, I didn't even tell my parents that was right because I thought they wouldn't understand. I mean, I guess conversely, in your work, John, um, you've not really uh, dealt with characters. I mean, you've written, you know, um, some superhero stuff, but <coughs> people like Dread, like the Button Man, uh, like Johnny Alpha, they're very much uh, characters whose identity is on their sleeve. But at the same time, you kind of get to explore their psychological uh, identity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dread, not for a long while before he got into his head a bit, but... Uh, tight boots. <laughs> yeah, tight boots, yes. Uh, yeah, they're, they're uh, on the surface, they're just hard men, but underneath there's there's another side to them. Uh, usually a more violent side. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's interesting uh, exploring that and, and working your way through it and finding out about them as you write it. Mm. You know, like I, I didn't know Dread really. I still don't completely know him, but you know, as I write him and uh, explore his deeper feelings as far as they go, I get to know him better. Mm. Uh, Johnny Alpha, he's, he's much more my kind of. I understand him better. The kind of morose mm. uh, guy with the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's uh, interesting, and Button Man is just a sheer psychopath mm. with a nice side. <laughs> but I mean, the history of violence is quite a complex portrait of, of a man's interior life. I mean, do you, do you remember where you got the idea for that, where that came from? Oh, I think it was dry rot in the house. <laughs> it was totally miserable, carrying it out to burn it. And uh, suddenly just the idea came to me. I don't know what the relationship was, but that, that's when it happened. 
just that little germ of an idea, a man who'd been hiding out for so long, hiding his past, and the one little thing, a missing finger, that gave it away. I'm into missing fingers. You'll find them in Button Man as well. They're sort of handy marker. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that, that uh, the whole hidden side of, of uh, the hero, they changed his name in the film, but the whole hidden side of McKenna was, was very interesting in the way it all came out. Uh, I, I wish they hadn't changed the third act. Mm -hmm. I think they felt it was probably too violent. <laughs> Uh, there was a, the film. I really enjoyed the film, but uh, uh, the third act was a, 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 a tonal change that I thought was wrong. It was very funny, but the change in tone just didn't go with the first two acts of the, of the story, which was a pity. Mm. I mean, I, I, I was really. I mean, you know, as a crime writer, of course, I'm fascinated in why human beings do terrible things to each other. And that's what all crime fiction is predicated on, is that very basic question. And it comes back to good and evil a lot. And so I'm fascinated by, especially men of violence or men who've had violent pasts who do try and, you know... I mean, I know guys have come out of jail, murderers have come out of jail and are trying to rebuild their lives. Mm. And there's always that... There's always going to be somebody there in a pub who wants to have a go at you mm. uh -huh. to, to prove that they're, they're bigger and, and tougher than you, especially if you've been jailed for an act of violence or whatever. And it's, you know, how these people change and does society allow them to change is an absolutely mm. fascinating question. I spent a few months, a long time ago, making a series for Channel 4, and it was meant to be about crime and punishment, but we got, <coughs> we got into much more basic questions and it ended up being about evil. It was called Ian Rankin's Evil Thoughts. Probably, <laughs> probably, we used to go up to, you know, we used to go to checking desks at airlines and there would be my folder going, Ian Rankin's Evil, and I'd say, I'm Ian Rankin, I'm checking in, please. And it was just weird. Um, but during the course of that series, I got to go to death row in Texas, interview a guy who was waiting to be executed. Um, <coughs> I spoke to the, his victim's daughter. Um, I spoke to the mother of a woman that had been murdered in England. Uh, I spoke to a guy that had arrested a serial killer in London. Um, I, was, I, I was exorcised by the chief exorcist of the Diocese of Rome. I didn't know that was going to happen, but I thought it was going to be an interview. But anyway, it was fine, fine. Um, once Did he got get rid of your evil thoughts? Well, once he got me off the ceiling and wiped the ball off my face, I was tip top, man, I tell you. Um, but at the end of that series, sorry, it's a long answer, but at the end of that series, I wasn't much further forward in pointing to an individual and saying, you're irredeemably evil. Um, but I could point to an act, an action, and say, at the point at which you carried out that act, you were performing an act of evil. Mm. But I did believe, I still do believe in redemption. Yeah. And I think it's, kind of, it's tough if you don't, mm. you know? And I think it comes across in a lot of the comics that are being written now, is it can be a hard road, mm. but there usually is redemption waiting at the end of it. Mm. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, blue t-shirt. Okay. I'm sure you've been asked this before, but what is it about Scotland that produces so many great comic and crime writers? <laughs> What's it about Scotland that produces so many great comic writers and crime writers? I, I don't know, maybe they put something in the water. Uh, I mean, you know, I come from Fife, which is a tiny wee bit of Scotland, but we've produced um, any number of great writers, and not only writers, but actors, musicians, you name it. Uh, we think we're part of some uh, weird experiment, um, some kind of X-Files type experiment that's been done on us when we were kids. We were all injected with something to try and make us creative. I don't know. Um, I, I think there's a storytelling culture. I mean, you know, my, my parents didn't read books, but my dad told stories all the time. When I was a wee kid, I would get into bed with my parents on a Sunday morning, and he would just riff, he'd just riff on us, make up a story. Um, and, and you just get used to it. it, get, it gets, you get hardwired for, for storytelling. Um, and, uh, I, and also, you know, if you were working class in Scotland, there was that sense that you could just get on with it. And in fact, I was lucky I grew up at a time of punk. Punk was a huge influence on a lot of us because punk said you don't have to have gone to the right schools, you don't have to be able to afford this or afford that. You just, if you want to do something, get out there and give it a go. And, and a bunch of us, you know, tried everything we could, writing for plays and writing, you know, acting, you name it. A whole bunch of us from that generation just went off and tried. And some made it and some didn't. There are an awful lot of good Scots artists as well. It's not just writers yeah. that... that comic world is full of good Scots artists. I don't know why. I think the Scots basically are a fairly intelligent race. If I compare it to like growing up in America, the, the, the basic level of intelligence there is much lower than in Scotland. Not planning to get more jobs yeah. in America. No, 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 no. He's, going, he's going. 
just I mean, one more trip and yeah. that's it. I, and maybe maybe it's a DC Thompson thing as well. I mean, you know, yeah, all these, I, all these, all, I mean, all those DC influence. Thompson yeah. comics that are Scottish. There was a, they, you know, just below the surface, they were, they were very Scottish. Uh, the humour and Ur Willie and the Bruins and all that kind of stuff were, were in your face, Scots. Um, and so that, you know, we thought people are telling stories about us from the get go. People are telling stories about us. Um, they they must share our concerns and everything else. So it might be that might be something to do with it. It's really interesting. There's also I mean, a big games industry in Scotland just now, which all comes out of the fact that Timex watches were made in Dundee. <laughs> and time, you know, Timex had a factory in Dundee, and when Timex went digital, all the parents got, who worked in the Timex factory got very got very digital literate and passed it on to their kids. And our kids, when they went to uni, all started doing digital uh, computing courses. And then they started the first digital uh, computer games course in the UK. It was in Abertay University. And they all went off and started companies, like Rockstar. Mm. They all came out of that. And they all came out of the fact that Timex watches were made in Dundee. <laughs> John and Ian, thank you very much. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening. Find out more about the festival at comicartfestival.com. Find out more about the show and how to contact us at comicartpodcast.uk. Find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Music composed by Pop Noir. This podcast is part of Britpod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritpodScene.com or BritpodScene on Twitter to find out more. Oh.